Hi, I'm Martin Jarvis, and once again, I want to welcome you to another perspective. Today we're going to talk about religions, kind of. You know, I've seen recently on social media debates about religion. And these debates have sort of evolved. Not too many years ago, it was the focus of the atheist vehemently uh, ragging on religious folks, particularly Christians, it seemed. But, but now it looks like the tide has changed a bit. And rather than the atheist chiming in as often as they used to, we, we find folks bickering between the religions on which religion is valid or which um, understanding or interpretation of religion is valid. I saw some black Hebrew Israelites yesterday, you know, railing against white Christianity. I, I have a Facebook friend who, who really embraces Judaism, the white Jews. <laughs> And, and really ragging against Christians. And, and we see Christians. I saw a prominent uh, preacher, well, from some time ago, John MacArthur, on a YouTube uh, channel actually ridiculing the movie The Jesus Revolution as being like satanic or something, you know. So it's very, very interesting how, how our, our attitudes have evolved. It's almost like the atheists have somewhat stepped back and just let the religious folks fight it out. So, of course, I'm going to put my two cents in today because we need to find some clarity in this. As many of you know, I'm a minister you know, in the Christian religion. I think I'm what's called a progressive or maybe a liberal minister, but not too liberal. I think... Um, my, my liberality uh, is more offered as grace to other folks, you know, than, than the, to what I would apply to justify my own lifestyle, okay? I think I live a pretty conservative life. Um, I think this particular conservative attitude that I live with has maybe less to do with the religion, but more to do with my maturity, maturing, because when I was young, man, <laughs> I was out there. 24-7, I was buzzed and on something, and I was in clubs every night of the week, and I was just doing all the things that I shouldn't have been doing, and uh, many of them were self-destructive, although it just seemed like fun at the time. And, and so we're going to talk about religion today, kind of. I think what we might want to start with is um, just to recognize that human beings of one form or another have been on this planet for like 600 million years, okay? That was one of the red flags of the religion to me, even as a young person, which by the way, I went from Sunday school uh, till I joined the military at 17, I become an atheist, not an angry atheist, just a logical atheist, uh, never ragging on anybody, any group. And, and for 10 years I was an atheist until one cold January morning I had this epiphany. It was like a revelation. You know, I couldn't sleep. And ordinarily I'd just get a little buzz if I couldn't sleep that night. I didn't even think to get that buzz. And through the course of, of a very short moment, I just believed that there was a divinity. Okay. And I've been on that path ever since. I was 28 then. I'll be 65 this year, 2023. So it's been a minute. But it's been a minute of discovery. I think when you come from a place of being, you know, uh, in, involved in religion seriously, especially as a young person, and, and go off and become an atheist for a decade and come back, uh, you're not the same individual you were when you left. You have a little bit of wisdom that you garnered from the world that you were exposed to. And, and, and so when you come back, you recognize that a lot of the things that you were taught uh, couldn't possibly have been true. And, and, you know, to be, be honest with you, that was part of the reason I departed, was, was some of the things that I was taught, some of the things that I was learned I knew couldn't possibly be true, like the earth being 6,000 years old, and I loved fossils and dinosaurs and all that good stuff, early man, Neanderthal, Gromagnon, Peking, all these, you know, all these things that we had proof of that existed, and it was like, um, 
this can't possibly be true. But you know, even as I was in Sunday school and I was going through that that sort of tugging both ways, it was like I would go to the altar like every other week, and then I go back to school and there'd be the girls and the my friends and all that. So I was like, you know, it was just back and forth, back and forth. But, but I think the, the straw that broke the camel's back, the thing that convinced me um, of atheist, to, to become an atheist, and it, it wasn't really like I, I decided to become an atheist. There wasn't the word atheist to me. It was just I just didn't believe. So I wasn't embracing, you know, a way of thinking and, and looking up and Googling and researching all the proof of why there was no God, all that silliness. I mean, if you're really, if you really simply don't believe, why would you be wasting your time researching reasons to support why you don't believe, listening to Dawkins or all these people to validate, you know, if, if you simply don't believe, just get on with your life and, 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 and religion shouldn't even be a, a part of your conscious thought unless a discussion came up. And for me, the discussions were always fun. They were never hateful. They were never, never insulting and, you know, never harsh or ragging on folks. I just, you know, I understood why they believed because they were raised in the same stuff I was raised in. I just personally didn't believe. So I, 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 I wasn't harsh toward folks, you know. I wasn't out there trying to validate my opinion or putting people down or having to get, you know, well, back we didn't have a social media, back then you get on social media to try to type why there is no God and it's, all that kind of stuff, man. To me, that shows me tip, uh, totally an individual that has no life if their function it is to seek out folks that believe in, in God or Allah, Yahweh, Krishna, whatever, or embrace a particular religion. And, and so I'm going to get follow them around and and and, and insult them or, or berate them and all. Kind of like that. That's a sign of tremendous immaturity and uh, and silliness. Okay. So I, the point is, I wasn't that kind of atheist. I just I just didn't even consider myself an atheist. I just didn't believe. So it wasn't that deep of a thing. It wasn't that important to me. Where the conversation wasn't part of my conversation every day. You know, I didn't have a whole bunch of friends that we all identified with and validated each other in atheism or anything. I was just a person who was raised in church and I just came to a point in my life where I just didn't believe. And that was it. I was fine, okay. And, uh, and then one cold January morning, I just believed. And, and I wasn't listening to a preacher. I wasn't in church. I wasn't listening to some guy on the radio or somebody's witnessing to me or anything. It wasn't nothing like that. It was a moment. I think of the fact was I didn't get that buzz that night. And my mind was clear. And, and I believe there was like, there is a divinity that, that touched my mind that day. Okay? And, uh, and that, it was changed. Everything was different, man. And, and when I, I went to my apartment that morning when I got up and I began to pick everything out of my apartment that I loved. Things I had picked up when I was overseas in the military from, from, from Korea and from Japan. And, and a lot of things that I had here like trophies, baseball, bowling, karate trophies, uh, jazz album collection, switchblade collection. All this cool stuff. My plants. I was growing my own. Everything. I just grabbed everything in my apartment that day that I loved. And I just took it all to the dumpster that day. Things that were irreplaceable. Couldn't be replaced. And I picked up over everything. I just took it to the dumpster that day because at that moment, I realized, I felt that all the things that I had based, who I, that I identified with as, as myself, they had no value. They had no value to me. And, and it wasn't even like I was upset or sad or happy or any kind of emotion. It was just like these things, I don't need these things. And I threw them all away. And, and I think, I put them in the dumpster that day. And I, I think often, you know, I wonder if, you know, there's always people, you know, crawling through the dumpsters, you know, poor people, people without looking for things, looking for things. I, I always wonder about the guy who was in my dumpster that day. <laughs> and, and I knew some of them. I remember some of the people that would go through those dumpsters. I was just wondering about that guy, what he found. Or maybe he was on his last leg. And maybe he was praying, oh, God, you know, if I don't find something, I'm just going to kill my... Who knows, man? But whatever that day, it was like eureka for that gentleman because everything was in there, you know, Things of real value, you know. And you know, when I go into like record stores, you know, I, I, I see when they have these old record albums, you know, that they, they're selling. I wonder how many of those might be mine. <laughs> the ones I threw away that day. I don't know. But anyway, that was my story. 
I was 28 when that happened. A couple years later, I, maybe two years later, I began, uh, started in a, in a feeding program at, at this local church for kids from, uh, from poor neighborhoods. Uh, I did that for a few years, and I signed myself on to a, a ministry, a juvenile detention center ministry. I did that for like 17 years. I also, at the same time, on Saturdays, would go through neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods, just knocking on doors, asking if people needed help, if they needed anything, you know. And, and, and many times they did. And so I guess, you know, if, if you would define, you know, what role I played is, as far as a religious person, I guess it would be in the role of evangelist, you know, as I was going out and telling people, telling people the good news about Jesus and all. And, you know, additionally, when I started, of course, because I went back to what I knew from Sunday school, I began, you know, toting that party line. I began, you know, as if you knew Jesus and confessing your sins and going through all that, you know. And... Uh, and I found in the course of, and at the same time, I was like promoting up through the church. You know, I started off in the church as a deacon, you know, for years. And, and I was an elder for years. And, and after what became a pastor, and I've been a pastor, staff pastor in a local church for like over 23 or so years, you know. And as well, I've had this program, these programs on TV for about 18 years. And I've been speaking in other places, you know, and, and just... It just growing and maturing. But, but I think the most beneficial, one of the most beneficial experiences I had was, was speaking at juvenile detention for those 17 years. Every week I spoke there for 17 years. I missed four weeks in 17 years. And, and, and I never went there with the determination that I just was going to say something. I always was determined that when I went there, I was going to find something of value for these young people that will actually change their lives, that, that they can either take with them and have this revelation, this light bulb go off while I was speaking to them, or, or they could just simply take something with them as they went about their lives later on in life. Always came up. And even as a minister speaking in churches, and even on this program here, never taking any opportunity I have to speak for granted, I always make sure I have something that will be beneficial, that will change the life of a listener, you know. But, you know, speaking to those kids, they begin to challenge me. See, see, if I'm speaking as a minister in a, in a, in a local church, okay, especially if it's a church that, that has the same denominational, you know, ideological beliefs that I have, they're going to amen me all night, you know. And half the time, they might even know what I'm talking about. But if it sounds good, they're going to say amen. But you're standing in front of a bunch of teenagers, who half of them don't even believe, and the other half, they, they kind of believe, or they were raised in church, their grandmama was in church, so they know a little bit about what you're talking about, but, but you just can't come there and say anything like anything unbelievable. Like, like what about all the people who died before Jesus came on the scene? You know? <laughs> Are they in hell where they didn't have a chance? And, and I know we, we come up with the religious folks. I mean, we've been asked those questions for so many years. We come up with semi-logical reasons why they could be okay and all, oh, they had another chance, you know, and all that, they're going to have another chance and all that kind of stuff. But, but the reality, much of what we have, we have ministered and preached, you know, across the pulpits and synagogues and mosques and all, just make no sense. Like the earth is 6,000 years old. Really? Come on now. There were no dinosaurs, you know. There, there was no such thing as evolution. Come on, there's too much proof. And so, so, so even in, in that journey from, from becoming a, a believer again, uh, even up until this point, it's been a matriculation, it's been a learning, it's been a, a time of simply challenging myself constantly, never uh, accepting the status quo, never accepting what everybody else believes. No, if what you believe doesn't make sense. No, and, I, and I, so I've evolved myself, and, and I don't mind reading um, uh, the Koran, or I don't mind reading, you know, Jewish uh, texts, or I don't mind reading the Bhagavad Gita, or, or anything else, or listening to another philosophy, or insight, or understanding, um, because I, I think I'm, I'm well entwined enough in, in my belief of a divinity, that, that I, I, I believe that I owe it to myself to challenge myself. To growth, I don't want to, to, to embrace something that, that probably isn't true. I want to be open enough to evolve, okay? And that's who I am today. And, and, and I think that is the foundation for the mess, what we're going to talk about today. 
Because what we see today is a lot of bickering between religious folks on what is right and what is wrong, you know, or this, this is correct and I'm right and you're wrong and I'm all this stuff going on, man. And, and so I see often, even with my Facebook friends, many of them religious and various religions will be making statements out there uh, to people who are not affiliated with their religion that they have to conform and, and take some sort of action based on what they believe or you'll be eternally lost or there's no hope for you anyway and, and all that kind of stuff. And this is what we're going to talk about today. I think another thing that has helped me be uh, maybe, I don't know if it's pliable, but more open to, to, to challenge w what I believe is, you know, I spent many years in the martial art from, from like around age 15 or so. Uh, and then after I left home, off and on through adulthood till I was in my early 30s or so. So I'm very, you know, well, you know, knowledgeable in the martial art. I say knowledgeable, not the best. Okay, I fought in many tournaments, but I won one trophy uh, in, in all those tournaments. Uh, and that trophy I threw away that day, you know, when I had my epiphany, you know. But, but the thing about the martial art is, is that you recognize that you are never there, okay? Uh, you're, you're forever learning. Not only are you forever learning, you're forever teaching. And I think, I don't know if that's how it works today, okay? Because I haven't practiced in a while. Um, but, but that's how it used to be, where, where you'd come in to learn, you know, join a karate club and you're a white belt. And, and you'd be there for the first two weeks learning how to punch because for some reason it was very difficult to do that. You know, you're like that trying to, you know, get, get the punch right. But eventually in a week or two, you got pretty good punches going on. And so you've been there two, three weeks and then you have somebody else new that joins the karate club. Well, guess what? You're still learning newer stuff. But then the instructor will say, you, teach him how to punch. And then you, who you have now perfected your reverse punch, you can go over here and teach this totally new guy how to punch. At the same time, you're learning. And in two weeks, you're learning more, you're learning more. And this new guy that you taught to punch, he's teaching the next guy how to punch. And that's the way it works. All the way up throughout the belts, throughout the rankings. At least that's the way it used to be, okay? And, and so there is, there, that is excellent because you're always a teacher and you're always a student. And, and there's a tremendous humility in that because you recognize you never know everything. There's always something new to learn that's gonna to add to your arsenal, that's gonna to add to your knowledge, that's gonna make you more a better person, you know, based on the experiences, okay? And, and I think I've carried that over, that martial art attitude, you know, even into this spirituality, this walk of spirituality that I'm involved in, okay? I remember, you know, practicing over the years, I practiced like, uh, I started off in Taekwondo, and then I, I practiced this Okinawan style, the Japanese type style of karate. I practiced that for about two and a half years or so. The raisin, because it was free, you know, it was, I was in high school, and, and when my English teacher was a brown belt, and one of the things he just liked to do was teach karate for free after school. So shoot, man, that won because it was free. Um, Later on in life, I, I practiced some different types of Kung Fu and, uh, and a little bit of Jiu Jitsu, a little bit of Judo, and, uh, which I don't like either of those two, simply because you can't be cool which, with some guy's butt up in your face, but you can be cool. <laughs> I gave up in the Bruce Lee era. So all I'm saying is, and then the Bruce Lee influence, his whole thing about you know, rejecting all these different styles. It was interesting, all these different type styles of martial arts that I practiced, all of the instructors, each instructor believed that their particular art was the best. And, and some of them were kind of fancy, like the Kung Fu's with the arms and all these kind of things. But, but, and the, ju, you know, the Jiu Jitsu and the Judo and all this stuff, not so much those guys. But the other, the Karate, the Taekwondo and the Okinawan Karate and all that. When you went to fight in a tournament, you know, it was funny. All, it all looked the same. People were just punching and kicking. And that was, that was about it. And uh, so although the, the instructors swore they were the best, you know, when it came down to the rubber met the road, they all looked pretty much the same <laughs> to the rest of us. And so I see that in religion as well. I, I believe that we're looking at, we know, well, the one thing we don't know is, is whether or not what we have embraced from a religious perspective is actually true, okay? And, and to me, from my perspective, probably most of it is not true, okay? Simply because it's almost impossible for us to comprehend 
that from which we've emanated because we weren't there when it started. Either we're going to say from a religious perspective that God always was, or we're going to say from a scientific perspective, just one day, boom, and everything just popped into existence. You know, both of them are simply be kind of a cop out to me, somebody that just doesn't know. But 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 so so that's pretty much uh, where we all fall somewhere between those two beliefs. Okay. And 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 personally, I I think that's an issue. Because I think number one is I think we need to start being more honest. First of all, try to understand the origin of our religions. But <laughs> when you consider that human beings have been on this planet for about six hundred million years in one form or another, and and religions have been on this planet for like four thousand years, I mean that's a big difference. So so what do you think was going on? You know, in between between. God or the divine or Allah, whatever you want to call it, and, and, and the creation, nothing. It's kind of hard to believe, okay? So, so it seems to me as men begin becoming more wise, more intelligent, more cognizant of their surroundings, and probably beginning with some of the philosophers, I think therefore I am, you know, Descartes and all that stuff, that, that, that these ideas of the divinity begin to pop into mind simply because there was a need to, to, to understand how all this came into being and, and what is our place. You know, obviously we are the, the more complex creatures of all of this that we are dwelling, this environment that we're in. We have to understand. We have to understand our origin, where we came from. And, and as we begin identifying that an entity had to have created us, then we, we went on to evolve a, a, a set of rules and, and, and stories, understanding, trying to determine, you know, exactly how we came into being, attributes of the entity, and, and what this entity expects from us, okay? And so depending on where you lived, it would determine on what religion was going to pop up, you know? And so we have so many. I think we have over 4,000 religions today on this planet, you know? And, and so when I see our religious brothers and sisters, you know, arguing on Facebook, like this is why I'm arguing that Judaism versus Christianity, that, that Christianity can't possibly be true, that Judaism is the true religion, okay? <sighs> that can be dismantled, you know, in so many ways. Uh, I'd, I'd just start with, you know, when you're looking at a white Jew, <laughs> that ain't even one of the Bible. We can go there if you want to. You know, or or we could, uh, you know, even even condemning the Jesus of the Christianity, but then using Jesus to try to prove points. I mean, all that stuff. As other Hebrew Israelites yesterday on YouTube, you know, ragging on some folks. People got so mad they started a little scuffle. There's just all this stuff going on. So so let me let me just give you my two cents. My, my feeling is humanity is like I was that morning, that cold January morning when I woke up one morning. Not really woke up, you know, in a physical sense because I couldn't go to sleep, but I woke up in my mind. And that, oh, I, all of a sudden I just realized there was a divinity, okay? And, and I think that's the starting point for all of the religions, I believe. And I believe the religions are here probably for good intentions. There were good intentions and motivations, you know, by people wanting, trying to understand it all. But, but, it, but, but they all began with a thought, an idea, and, and, and a belief that something greater than us exists, okay? And, and so what I want to share today is, I, I mean, I don't mind, I don't mind examining the holy books. I don't believe the holy books were written by God. I, what I believe is the holy books were just written by a, a myriad of, of people with good intentions, their opinions. And over the thousands of years, we began to simply embrace these as actually, you know, these are the words of God, whether it be the Quran, whether it be the, uh, the Bible, whatever, okay? What I'm suggesting is we just ra roll it back, you know, to the origin and recognize that, that people were on this planet 600 million years before these religions came into effect. And, and so let's not... Now, see, we'll say, well, why are you uh, a minister in the Christian religion? Because that's the religion I'm in. I believe whatever religion you're in is fine. Whatever holy book you're reading is fine. Just, just recognize the difference in those holy books between what is good and what is not good. Okay? So, so, so loving the, the origin. 
That, that from which one, one thing we can pretty much be assured of is that all humanity emanate from the same source. Okay, so, so love that source or respect that source. And, and then respect the children of that source who are related. We're all related to each other. So love each other or respect each other. Maybe that's a better word. And, and take care of each other. And, and to me, those are, are the, the, the subjects of all of the holy books that we can gravitate toward. Any, any of the negativity, any of the segregating points, any of the ostracizing, the you're not good enough, you're not good enough, we can pitch that, put that aside. But anything that is motivating, anything that is encouraging, anything that is uplifting, anything that is inspiring, keep those things. Well, those things would be the good things. Those things would be the righteous things. How do I help people? How do I care for people? You know, Ten Commandments is a good thing as well. Do your best to do the best for other folks and, and don't make excuses for your evil, okay? For real. And that's pretty much it. There is going to be a wellness in that. So, so then I remember recently I was asked, you know, about, you know, killing somebody. <laughs> I mean, when you look at people that are like on death row or people that have done heinous atrocities to other people. Now, listen, what I believe from, from, a, from a spiritual perspective and kind of from a quantum physics perspective, from a cycle of life, you know, perspective and all, that nobody really dies, okay? That, that, that in, in one form or another, we all continue. We do lay down these lives and we outgrow them or the, 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 the bodies outgrow us. They age and then they die or something traumatic happens for whatever reason and we lay these bodies down. We continue, okay? in one way or another. So we're all eternal beings. I don't believe in there's going to be an eternal damnation from somewhere for something that you did or something that you said and all. Um, because this is where, where, my, where my, I guess, logic or my, my righteous logic kicks in. That, that first of all, either we're all evil or we're all not held accountable for our evil. The problem, I think, with religions is some religions have determined that you can be evil, but you can be evil, but you can be forgiven. But you're still evil. You're just forgiven. Come on. That, that's flawed. I think Curtis Mayfield once said, you know, one of his songs, if there's a hell below, we're all going to go. Okay. So, so I think even as being a minister in a Christian religion from, for all this time, I, I think I, I can make a point that humanity is well because of what Jesus did, if in fact that's what happened. Because of what Jesus did, humanity has been made well. And, and our role as human beings and as believers is to help each other be well. That's the gospel message. That's the good news is that you're well. Now let me help you be well in your life, okay? And um, and so that's a reality to me as far as, far as our eternal existence to, to where there are some people that simply need to be removed from the society because they bring chaos. Whether it's a terrible dictator, you know, that, 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 oppresses the people, whether it's an individual that victimizes people, even in his own little town or community. There are, there are certain crimes that, that, that disturb the peace, that created chaos, and people simply need to be removed. And again, I don't believe that removal is removing them into eternal damnation. It's just a removal that's taking them off, out of our society, out of our presence, because they're committing so much chaos. So I don't believe anybody dies, although the body may lay down, the body may die, the individual continues. So I have no problem removing a person, you know, from our presence.